which I stop switch, can't stop switching all the day. Uh, so Harald Welte and Steve Markgraf are going to show you what or other awesome things you can do with GSM. Please have a great welcome. I'm uh, sort of waiting for my screen to show up there um, on the screen. I'm not sure if anyone can do something about that. Ah, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the welcome. Um, I'm Harald Welte. Over there is Steve Markgraf. We're going to talk about Osmocom BB, which is a project that's not even one year old, um, but has already managed to, uh, well, create uh, quite a lot of results. Um, it's about running your own GSM stack on a mobile telephone. <clears throat> now, um, I'm going to go through a bit of a, I don't know, conceptual introduction. By the way, if you've been to this presentation or to my presentation about the same subject at DeepSec or a different event, um, it's not really going to be that different. So, um, to introduce about GSM and 3G protocol security, um, there's some, some observations that I want to share. Uh, mostly that both the GSM and TCP IP protocol specs are as, as publicly available as uh, the other one. So there's no difference in availability of public information. And if you look at the internet protocol stack, and I mean, when I say internet protocol stack, I mean Ethernet, Wi-Fi, TCP IP, and so on, they receive a lot of scrutiny from the academic community, from the independent hacker community, from whoever. Everyone looks at those kind of protocol security issues for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years now at least. Um, GSM networks are as widely deployed as the internet. The, uh, if you look at the user base, number of subscribers, we're talking about billions of, of I think three billions is what the GSMA claims uh, these days. Um, but the GSM and 3G protocols don't receive that amount of scrutiny. They don't uh, get the amount of research, uh, despite the fact they're widely deployed networks, the, the specifications are open. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. And um, that's uh, what I want to talk about for a minute or two. The GSM industry is extremely closed, and I frankly have to add it's closed-minded as well. Um, there are only very, very few closed source protocol stack implementations that uh, exist. Um, four might be too low a number, but if it's four or six, it doesn't really make a big difference. My point is it's a small number. Um, the chipset manufacturers that produce uh, baseband chipsets that are used in mobile telephones uh, never release hardware documentation publicly. They even only release it in a very limited fashion to the actual cell phone manufacturers. Um, and it's, it's a very closed, um, closed club. If we look at the, the handset manufacturing side, the companies that manufacture these devices, um, we have, uh, well, First of all, before we get into device manufacturing, we have to look at the chipset manufacturing. The companies that produce the baseband chipsets that are in those uh, telephones, and there are only very few companies that build those uh, uh, baseband chipsets today. It's once again, I would say, number about six. Um, and uh, those companies, they, you know, they, they license an operating system kernel from somewhere else. They often license uh, or used to license a GSM protocol stack from somewhere else. Um, and only very few handset manufacturers are large enough to be a member of the club and to become a customer of them. It's not like any other electronic component where you, you just go to DigiKey and you order it, or you go to your favorite uh, semiconductor distributor and you buy a couple of thousand, a hundred or ten, or whatever is the amount you want. Right? It's not like this. The cell phone baseband industry, if you, if you ever find any public documentation about those chipsets at all, on the websites of the companies that manufacture them, it always says asterisk, and asterisk in the footnote says, this product is for large selected customers who produce large volumes of handsets only. So you have to be one of the select customers to even get access to the technology. Um, so there are, you know, a couple of dozen companies, if at all, that are large enough that drive the millions of units of quantity that they can actually become a customer of those companies. If you look at the network manufacturing side, it's very much the same situation. Um, this is not really the subject of this talk. I just want to outline this. The network equipment, the cell towers, the backend equipment, the core GSM network, and so on. There's only Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens, Alcatel, Lucent, and Huawei, and a couple of other smaller ones. Um, and only operators buy equipment from them. Uh, and the prices are extremely high since the quantities are low and it's professional grade equipment and professional grade equipment always has to cost 10 times at least the amount. Um, 
So if we look at the GSM and generally the cellular operators, it's also a very unfortunate situation. Now, some operators may take this uh, as an insult. Uh, I apologize for that, but it really is that operators, at least many operators, are banks and marketing departments today. Operators outsource not only the network planning, the network deployment, and the network servicing, but they also outsource the network billing. So what else is there to remain, right? It's, it's marketing, it's sales, um, and it's finance. Um, and the operators mostly only know the, the closed equipment as they're shipped by the manufacturer. They get, their staff get some training in how to configure it, how to put it there, how to set it up, how to make it work. But they have very limited understanding of how it actually works. Um, and if you talk to some operators, then you will hear, yeah, you know, 10 years ago we still got the full source code from Ericsson and we could see what's actually going on, but these days they don't give it to us anymore. Um, this is the kind of uh, stories you hear um, from those few people at operators who actually would go down to the lower protocol layers. Now, the security implications of all of this is that we have very few people who actually understand the protocol stack outside the manufacturers of the baseband processes and the network equipment. There is very li relatively limited protocol level research. Um, if you find research, it's related on the cryptographic side. Um, it's on application level, like mobile malware and so on. It's all important research, but it's on a different level than, than uh, the kind of stuff that I happen to be interested in. And before OsmoCom BB and OpenBSC and OpenBTS and the projects that uh, have been started in the last uh, two years, um, we didn't have any open source protocol implementations, which I believe are key to make people able to learn more about this. Um, there's no point for any student to just read a textbook about GSM protocols. I mean, they're not even any good textbooks for, the, for that, you know, as a start. But even if you want to read those textbooks, you cannot make any practical exercises. You cannot go to a lab. You cannot test what, what you've been reading about, unlike the Internet. And this is really the reason why the Internet has received so much analysis, so much innovation, so much scrutiny, God knows what. And the GSM world is this, this you know, closed uh, user group. Um, now, if you want to look more at the protocols, how do you get started? You can start on the network side. This has been done by OpenBSC and OpenBTS in the last couple of years. I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, this has been done. And in January um, last year, uh, I decided to take off uh, three months in order to um, get started on actually doing the telephone side protocol stack. GSM is very asymmetric on the air interface and on any other interface. So if you run a network equipment, then you can exchange data with, uh, with phones. And if you run a telephone, then you can exchange data with the network. But you can never exchange data directly from phones or directly from one BTS to another BTS uh, in, in the actual fixed network. So it's very asymmetric. So if you want to send arbitrary packets to, to uh, networks, uh, to, to BTSs, base station controllers, all the actual network operator equipment, what you need is sort of the Wi-Fi card or the Ethernet card of GSM where, like on the internet, you have a very stupid transceiver that implements the physical layer, the MAC layer, and all the IP packets and, and every bit in the IP header and the TCP header and so on, you can define yourself, you can modify, you can, you can handcraft, you know, strange packets, you can see how systems react to that. In GSM, so far, this has not been possible, um, at least not using publicly av available equipment. And this is why we started OsmoCom BB, um, there have been some other projects that try to do this um, have, that have failed. There was a TSM-30 project in the past, and there was MadOS. Um, they both got very far, but they never actually got to the point where their own code could run and could drive the full telephone hardware and could actually interact with the uh, telephone network. So bootstrapping processes, you read about GSM specifications, you start to grow knowledge about the protocols, um, and so on. You, you try to get protocol traces and, and uh, you, you start to work from there. Since we've been doing the network side GSM stack with OpenBSC uh, in the past, of course we already had a lot of experience, now we only needed to implement the other part. This is just a rough overview of how a GSM network works, just to um, get this back into your um, memory. Uh, you may have seen this before. What we are talking about here is the air interface. That's the interface between the telephone and the BTS. And now we want to run a telephone where every aspect of the air interface, of the physical layer, of the medium access layer, of the higher layers, are entirely controlled 
um, and defined by open source software so we can modify the timing of the signals, the power of the signals, we want to modify every bit of the signal, everything. And that's why we want to own the baseband here and run our custom code on this phone so we can generate signals towards the BTS which then gets forwarded into the actual core network of GSM. Not going to go into the details here. Um, this is just, if you read the slides so you get explanations for the acronyms what those are. Now, what kind of protocols do we have? Yeah, we have to go through this quickly. You want to see an extensive demo, don't you? So, um, we have a protocol stack um, that is defined by a couple of layers. First of all, there's the radio layer. It's specified in GSM technical specification, TS04.04. .04. If you Google for GSM TS04.04, .04, .04, you will get the very uh, specification that we're talking about. So this is, again, the pointer is uh, if you want to read more. On top of the radio layer, we have the LabDM, which is a, a ISDN-derived um, uh, layer 2 protocol. And on layer 3, we have um, sub layers that are called radio resource mobility management and call control. And then there is sort of stuff that's not really defined as a layer, but there are more layers uh, without a defined number for USSD, SMS, location services, and so on. Um, in order to, uh, well, look at the various security problems that have been described in theory in order to practically implement them, we now need to implement the protocol stack and we need to implement drivers on the actual hardware um, uh, to, to run that code. The couple of interesting security problems that have been widely spoken about is, well, there's no mutual authentication. We know that by now that leads to IMSI catchers, it leads to man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, rogue base station attacks, whatever you might call them. Weak encryption algorithms, we've been hearing all about this. We know encryption is optional. We know there is a denial of service against the random access channel, which has first been publicized by our co-developer Dieter Spahr in late 2009. Um, we also know there's the radio resource location protocol that uh, allows the network to obtain GPS fixes of the handset without any information to the user. There are all kinds of issues in, in GSM regarding security and privacy. Now, what we, need to want, what we need to do is we need to control the baseband processor in the telephone. If you don't know much about how um, modern telephones work, then um, let me just say the baseband processor is not what you run your, your uh, Android on or your Windows Mobile or your Symbian or well, Symbian maybe in some cases. But in, in smartphones, you typically have two processors. One of them is the application processor that runs the user interface and, and you know, all the high-level stuff. Then you have the baseband processor, which is completely independent or not so independent. Um, but in, it's a, a separate processor running a separate operating system running a separate code base. Um, so uh, this is the, the processor we're talking about. So what is this processor? We typically see ARM7 or ARM9 cores in the low-end phones that we are looking at uh, and the GSM uh, as, as a first step. It's ARM7 cores. They run some real-time operating system. Sometimes actually they don't run any operating system because it's not required to have an operating system for the kind of tasks it does. Um, we very often, or well, at least on an ARM7 core, it's very clear that you have no memory prote protection between tasks because, well, an ARM7 doesn't have a memory management unit. There are no virtual addresses. There's nothing. Um, then next to the ARM core, you have a DSP. The actual DSP model and type depends on the vendor of the baseband chipset. The DSP runs the signal processing part for the RF layer 1. It's only the signal processing part. Um, don't think that the DSP runs the entire layer one. That's a wrong assumption. So uh, the DSP really only does signal processing and it's triggered uh, by, by the ARM. So the ARM core is the master DSP sort of an acceleration slave in, in, in the um, device. The software stack, well, is written in C and assembly, lacks modern security features most of the time at least. Uh, and uh, well, Philip Weinmann has already um, spoken about this yesterday, what kind of things you can do with this. Now, the GSM baseband chipset that we're looking at uh, in the Osmo ComBB project uh, is uh, looking like this. Uh, this is just a very high-level overview. We have a digital baseband processor on the left-hand side. Contains the DSP, contains the ARM core, contains some static RAM, some mask ROM, uh, UART, SPI, the typical microcontroller peripherals, right? It's like an, you know, uh, any random ARM7 microcontroller with a couple of GSM-specific peripherals inside. Um, next to that, we have the analog baseband, the ABB, 